it all began so beautifully. Lyndon Johnson and Mrs. Johnson have just arrived. Lyndon and I rode down the avenue in one car. Suddenly, there was a shot. I've heard the words, the president is dead. Mrs. Kennedy's dress was stained with her husband's blood. I asked her if I couldn't get somebody to help her change. She says, oh no, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. We have this from Washington. Common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity first struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. As the wife of the president, only I would see events unfold from that particular vantage point. I ought to record this. And it was incredible. I want to be on hand, whatever he's doing. You want to listen to my critique? Yes, ma'am. You are a little reckless. You need to read it with a little more conviction. In general, it was a good B+. Plus. Lindbergh came flying into my room. Mama, Mama, Dr. King's been shot. Evening assumed a nightmare quality. The White House was like a fortress. Nobody gets out, nobody gets in. The phone jarred me awake. It was Lyndon saying Senator Kennedy had been shot. What is our country coming to? What is happening to us? Are we a sick society? The world had changed overnight, but Vietnam dominated the news. He, I, and the children, Linda and Lucy, will be criticized and slandered for things we have done, things we never did at all. That Vietnam War is for the birds. Linda Bird, Lady Bird, Lou Bird. This will be painful. It's a perilous path to tread. Burial of Bobby Kennedy. I found myself in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. I felt extreme hostility. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage in the world is to get up in the morning and go about the day's work. It is an endurance contest, this job. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs>
of audio tapes about her experiences as first lady in the White House. So um, ABC News had uh, done a podcast, uh, it's a terrific podcast. I recommend it to everybody. Good to know. Um, that was based on a book by Julia Swig, and ABC came to me. I had made a series about Bobby Kennedy called Bobby Kennedy for President, and it's right. on Netflix, still on Netflix. Um, and I had also made a movie about uh, John Lewis, and so right. ABC knew that I news knew that I was interested in this time period, and so they came to me and said, you know, we have these these tapes. <laughs> what do you think? Could this be a movie? So I started listening to the tapes and poking around in the archives, and we created a film that is essentially narrated by Lady Bird Johnson yeah. in her own voice. So this is not, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of, I think, exciting work with AI and creating people's voices, but this is actually her voice. So I want to make that clear. This right. is Lady right. Bird's actual record, tape recording. Yeah. And uh, we paired that with uh, archival material. So the film is, there are no talking heads, there are no interviews. It's literally just her recording paired with archival material. Okay. So I was, we're going to dive into her the diaries and, and the film, but uh, you just raise a good point. I mean, you're a director. What's it like to make a film with no people, in, in essence? I mean, you, <laughs> I mean, like live, you know, this is, it's not purely archival-led either. I mean, this is very interesting what you've done. What was, yeah. the, what was the challenge there? Well, um, you know, like everything in life, there's uh, challenges and benefits. So, um, and in this case, they're probably the same. <laughs> mm. the, the challenge was, can we tell a story without any contemporary interviews? Right. Um, uh, so the, the fun part about it was kind of going through, combing through, uh, listening to all the tapes. Right. And then searching for, you know, what are we going to see? <laughs> the film, you got to see right. something. Exactly. So, so searching. Um, and what um, I found that was really creatively satisfying was um, this film was possible because Lady Bird Johnson was a journalist. And right. so her diaries are very, very detailed and meticulous. And what we started finding is when we would listen to the diaries and then find archive that was from the time period, it was a really good match. Mm. She, had, she was a really good note taker. She also did something that became really crucial for us, which is she noted what reporters were attending different speeches or events. Mm. So when she talked about... Um, a, a woman reporter coming to the White House to interview her, she would list, you know, the person's name and their network and where they were from. Or when there was Johnson was signing an important bill, she right. would know which reporters were there. And the reason that became so, so important is um, it, it's something that actually reflects back on, on kind of the challenge of making this film. And that was um, when we first started looking for archive to match up with mm -hmm. her, her recording. Um, we, you know, when you do archival research for films, you, you put in the name of the subject and you kind of search the databases. Right. And when we did that, there was very, very little listed under Lady Bird Johnson, which seemed very odd. She's the first lady of the United States. And remember, right time when media is really you know becoming you know just just is covering a lot this is mm. you know there's a reason why we say vietnam was the most televised war i mean this is during that period of the 60s so we put in the name lady bird johnson just a little bit came back you put in the name mrs johnson a little bit more you put in the name the search term president's wife and the date and even more and so we pretty quickly realized that although there was actually a lot of footage of her and her in the White House and her speeches mm -hmm. and trips and events, it wasn't always noted by the archivist. They weren't noting when Lady Bird was in the frame. And so we used her diaries as the guide to where to go look. So we would say, NBC, this particular reporter covered mm. this event. Do you have footage from that day? And then it would appear. Right. 
So, you know, kind of one of the themes of the movie is that women are overlooked and her contribution as first lady was overlooked. This is not a film where we found tapes under a bed or in an attic. This is a film where all the archive was present, but nobody asked for it until we asked for it. That's and amazing. so I wanted to make the point that we could make an entire movie of archive with her in it front and center. Right, right. Um, even though the the people archiving the material at the time didn't even note her presence. That's that's amazing. I mean, you you mentioned that she made notes, but did she write out the things that she made in terms of her audio diary, or did she just do? Because it's it's very eloquently said. I mean, you know, it'd be amazing to just do that off off the cuff. Yeah. No, she would. So Lady Bird um, graduated with a dual degree from the University of Texas, and right. one of her degrees was in journalism. And she owned a radio station, That's so right. she was just so she would make note, you know, audio notes. So and so was there, you know, at the time of this speech. Here are the reporters who attended. And then, of course, we had books, and we had Julia Flagg's book. So right. we had a number of, you know, sources for. Um, and she wrote a book based on her own diaries. Um, it's like this really like thick book um, mm. that that she you know so she was she was a historian she was she was her own archivist and she literally says in the diaries I hope historians will make use of these one day you know she she wanted there to be documentary yeah. um, uh, material created from the the treasure trove of um, memories that she left with us. So you've uh, obviously a lot of these. I mean, how many hours was it? It's it's an amazing. One hundred and twenty-three. One hundred and twenty-three. <laughs> yes, you know that number very well. I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's tattooed on your forehead. It's uh, but uh, the so you you've gone through all this, and you and your archivists, uh, archive producers, have gone through all this uh, this recordings. I mean, what what struck you most in going through those uh, recordings? I, I was struck by how detailed she was. I was struck by how disciplined she was. She made recording, you know, almost every day. Um, she made, you know, really. She was, she was, she was doing this a lot. Um, but I was also struck by how observant she was, mm -hmm. and how she was really always very conscious of her place in history. And Lady Bird was, um, you know, when we look back at these events we now know their historical significance. Right. But of course, when you're living through something, you don't know if this is going to turn out to be an important thing or, or if it's just something that struck you. So, you know, she would say, I watched Gunsmoke and, you know, <laughs> I, I spoke to Lyndon and this is what we had for dinner and this is what I'm thinking about. Oh, and he says we might have a small war on our hands. So you really had to listen to the entire mm. tape because some things she would say very matter of factly, that small war was the Vietnam. Right. Right. <laughs> and she tells us when, you know, she and Lyndon and his close advisors really started to think this is kind of, you know, getting out of control. Um, and of course, soon Vietnam, you know, almost overwhelmed his presidency and uh, becomes a significant factor in his stepping down and not and deciding not to run again. Mm. But what I found interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this has been out there before, but it's, you know, you've, you bring it to life is, uh, you know, there, this idea of not running in 68 had been there almost from the beginning. You know, she had she had worked with him, had even put all these notes together saying, you know what, in March of 68 is when you announce that you will not be running. That's exactly right. And, and I think that that is a really great example of what a terrific strategist Lady Bird Johnson mm. was, but also how important she was as part of his inner circle. So she literally wrote out, you know, what you ought to do is finish JFK's term, run one more time, and then retire in March of 1968 and not run again. And that's exactly what he did. And right. of course, they could not know that Bobby Kennedy would be um, assassinated, right. that King right. would be assassinated, that's that right. all of these terrible things, you know, would happen. Um, and Johnson thought about, you know, kind of, should he, was that the right decision? You know, like, like after Bobby mm. Kennedy's has, but, you know, by then kind of the die was cast that he had made this announcement and 
um, that's what happens. But, you know, when, when we think about this, Ken, Bobby Kennedy's assassination in June of 1968, um, the country was just worn out by protests, by these, mm. this terrible violence. Um, and the Democratic Party didn't rally around, the Humphrey election was close, but Richard Nixon ends up taking, you know, winning. And, you know, then another project I've just finished. So I'm thinking about these things, you know, mm. together. Yeah. Nixon appoints four Supreme Court justices. Imagine if either, like, Johnson had stayed in the presidency or if Bobby Kennedy had won. The trajectory of the United States Supreme Court would be completely different. I want to. I think that's a very, very interesting and very important point. And I want to actually uh, give our listeners and viewers a quick break and and then come back to it because I think you, it really some things that really struck me watching this film in terms of present day. So um, uh, we'll be right back with uh, Don Porter, the director and executive producer of the Lady Bird Diaries, released in November and streaming on Disney Plus. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or X to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning filmmaker Don Porter, director and executive producer of The Lady Bird Diaries, released in November on Disney+. Plus. Um, so we were just talking about how the trajectory of the United States could have gone, cha- been different. Uh, that fateful year of 1968 gets referred to a lot. A few years ago felt like 68. I've even talked to another filmmaker who, th- who lived through 68 and said he think- thought it 2000 was another 68. But regardless, that's maybe sort of pop historians uh, having a little chat. But uh, what struck me in her in uh, Lady Bird's diaries and what you document is at one point I've, I've, if you closed your eyes and heard a different accent, that could be the current first lady in the office. That could be um, probably any most first ladies in the office. I mean, it's she's talking about the nonstop media glare. You know, she's talking about what the young people are going through and and in turmoil and. In, in a very t- tumultuous period in U.S. history. And it feels like that's, it could be been written today. I, I, I agree with that completely. And that is something that struck me also. You know, when you have such a, a voluminous amount of material to choose from, you know, mm-hmm. all these hours of her diaries, um, you, in order to, to kind of make sense of it, what we did is we we chose themes. So there were themes that I was really interested in. Um, in addition to like all the highlights, you know, I guess if you want to call it that way, or all the significant events that happened, I was also interested in like, what is it like to raise children in the White House? Right. <laughs> what is it like to be, you know, the spouse of the President of the United States? Um, civil rights was, of course, really interesting to me. And so, um, but I do think you see some, some, you know, kind of really fascinating parallels. Um, we, you know, one can only think about Michelle Obama, you know, a double Ivy League graduate who right. is trying to figure out how does she have a professional life as well as be the spouse and raise, you know, young children um, in the White House, um, be the mother and the wife that she wants to be in addition to a public servant, which is what right. the first lady of the United States is. Right. Um, lady Bird Johnson had to figure out her place. And this is, you know, she's straddling these eras. She's coming from a night being a 1950s congressional spouse, you know, a white woman um, where women's rights are not, mm-hmm. you know, are really curtailed and really prescribed. You know, at the time she's, she's operating, women can't have their own bank accounts and credit cards. Right. And she goes back to figuring out, like, how am I going to, you know, what, how am I going to be of service? And how am I going to do that and kind of be true to my own ambitions and my own goals for my own life, as well as my goals for my country? Right. right. So I, I think every first lady has to ask herself, you know, until now, it's it's always herself, right? It's, it's right. always the first spouse has always been a woman. Right. Um, 
And so I think they're, they all ask this question. It's not, it's not lost on me and probably on any of your listeners and viewers that Jill Biden is the first, you know, spouse to have paying work outside of her job as the first lady. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's 2024 and we haven't had any first lady, even people who had significant careers, you know, able mm. to work outside of, of the demands of the White House. So I, I do think, um, you know, Lady Bird is dealing with protests, with media coverage, um, with scrutiny of her personal life and appearance, yeah. um, and and also wanting to be of service. And that's something that I think most of the first ladies of the United States, many, many of them have wanted to use their platforms for the betterment of the country. Yeah. And, and I think it's so interesting to see how they all navigated that. I think that's uh, no. I, I, I think it's a very good point, and in other ways, she's also this very transitional p- figure, first lady figure. I mean, let's let's put her in perspective because I think uh, even in your, is it a log line or that you all have uh, with the film? That's uh, she's probably the, one of the most influential and least understood first ladies in history. So let's start with that first one. How is she one of the most influential? You know, some of the things that Lady Bird uh, Johnson did that I don't think she's really given credit for is she laid the groundwork for establishing the East Wing. So let's right. start there. She insists that President Johnson pay um, a staff for her and she hires all women. So she gets mm. a paid, you know, uh, press secretary, an assistant. And Rosalind Carter is credited to her credit with formally establishing the East Wing, but it was Lady Bird Johnson who said, this is a job and I need assistance and we should pay them. This is a career. And so Lady Bird really establishes that. Um, In addition, she's actually also the first first lady to campaign alone for her husband during a presidential race. So that whistle stop tour that she does, she's the first lady to do anything like that. You mean um, even Eleanor Roosevelt didn't even do anything? Eleanor like Roosevelt made speeches for her husband after he was in office, but Lady Bird goes out on the campaign trail alone. Yeah. And when you think about that campaign trail, it's so, so significant. Yeah, Johnson cannot lose the South, right. and he cannot lose the Black South in particular because that's what propelled Kennedy over the top to win before him. He's right. got to keep the South, but he also can't alienate the white voters who are, you know, many, many of whom are not so uh, supportive of the civil rights agenda that's going to bring the black voters there. So once again, we see a complete parallel to today's history where Mm. you've got to, you know, gather the the support of of a, you know, great number of these these, uh, individual constituencies Mm. and some of their goals are competing. So Lady Bird, you know, Johnson sends his white Southern wife into the south <laughs> during one of the most tumultuous periods in civil rights you know history um and she does she does that you know she really does actually deliver yeah and i mean and you've you already talked about we already talked about how she even you know she's talking strategy with him and they had this whole strategy about the uh the white house and in his political career and giving critiques on his speech, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, you make uh, at the very end of the film, uh, no spoil, spoiler alert, I guess, te- potentially, but yeah, President Obama references. Uh, but um, um, there's also this uh, thing you capture, there's this, uh, we don't need to go into the details of this, but there's this little bit of a scandal that happens before the 64 election, and um, basically she wants to come out with her own statement for this uh, close uh, friend of theirs and Johnson's, ba- you know, LBJ, basically Lyndon says no. Yeah, because they're all LBJ. I have to watch that. Uh, yeah. they, you know, <laughs> Lyndon says, you you know, no, we're not going to say it that way. And she goes, no, I, I am. And you, you'll see what I have to say. It's already been cleared. And <laughs> and she goes ahead and does it. She goes ahead and does it, you know, and and uh, it's been a really sensitive topic, a very close well, age. You know, their their closest friend and, you know, a multi-decade friend and advisor and, you know, employee of the Johnsons um, is involved in a situation where he's, he's outed for, you know, yeah. um, homosexual activity. Yeah. And 
uh, Johnson literally instructs her and says, you can't get involved in this. And she says, like in one of like my favorite moments in the film, and she says, my love, my love, it's already, <laughs> it's it's, already done. <laughs> yeah, it's done. It's too late. I've cleared it by Abe. And, done. And, uh, she did it. Yeah, I cleared yeah. it with Abe Fortas. And, and you know, Clark she, Clifford. And, yes. And yeah. she, she just went ahead. And what she did is, and, and this is important too, Lady Bird owned, she bought a radio station in, in Texas. Austin. Yeah. And she, like that radio station becomes the basis for their wealth. Like Johnson wasn't a wealthy person. <laughs> and when he was over in war, she ran his congressional office. Right. So she was not, you know, people, um, if they know her, they say like, didn't she plant flowers? And like, she, she, she had some flowers planted. <laughs> she did. <laughs> but she did, she did quite a bit more. So, um, you know, another thing that's really interesting to me is when Kennedy is assassinated, the United States did not have a plan for succession in place. So today we know mm. if, if the president is assassinated, goodness forbid, and the vice president is sent to the presidency, the third in line is the Speaker of the House, right? right. That, that situation was not established until That's after right. Kennedy uh, was assassinated. And so Johnson had no vice president for mm. that year and a half that he fulfills Kennedy's term. And so what he had was a group of advisors, including, of course, Lady Bird. And the press used to jokingly refer to her as Mrs. Vice President. Oh, wow. <laughs> so people knew, you know, at the time what kind of influence she had. Um, and what I, I think is so interesting is um, she both did and didn't accept the limits on her authority that mm. society was giving her. So... She, you know, she didn't demand credit for her contributions, and but she didn't stop making them. She went mm -hmm. ahead and forged a path and did the work that she was going to do. And she wasn't looking, you know, to be credited for it. She was just looking to get the work done. How and she was a brilliant strategist in that. And do you think because she wasn't seeking credit, is that is that why you maybe you would describe her as maybe one of the least understood? That there's I think this, so. Yeah. You know, I, I think that um, her priority was getting things done. And her mm -hmm. daughters, um, who have been just uh, lovely, uh, you know, become lovely friends during um, oh, wonderful. The, yeah, the touring of the film. And, you know, they remark, um, both of them individually, Linda and Lucy, um, said, Daddy thought Mother was the smartest person he knew. And he, they ran everything by each other. They were had a, actually a very contemporary marriage in that sense. Mm. Um, and yet I think a woman today would have a lot more expectation that she would be, you know, given credit for her contributions. And Lady Bird just, I don't know, she just didn't demand that at the time. Mm. Maybe how, you know, maybe things have changed in that way. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to be, it looks like we're actually coming close to the end of our, our time together, uh, uh, Dom, but I just wanted to just say, uh, well, what's next for you? I mean, I think you mentioned uh, this, is this is this uh, Supreme Court doc, uh, is that come out already? Yeah, so I um, I've just completed, it's a four-part um, series um, uh, for Showtime and Paramount Plus on the okay. Supreme Court. So we start at the Warren Court, which is the court in the 1950s. Mm. Um, and then bring it all the way to today. And the kind of the the animating theme is how did we get here? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> what what has happened? Right. Um, but we start with the Warren Court because you know that's the court that gives us Brown v. Board of Education, that gives mm. us you know all of these like all, Miranda warnings, all these right. significant right. cases concerning individual rights. The Warren Court establishes that the Supreme Court is going to decide those cases. And so then we kind of uh, march forward uh, from there. Okay. And uh, if, if in case people hadn't figured it out already, you've got a background as a lawyer, don't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into filmmaking? I, um, I used to work for ABC Television and ABC News. And okay. um, I, I was at a law firm, then at ABC, and then at A&E. 
And uh, though I watched a lot of really smart, terrific producers doing their jobs and watching them do their jobs, I thought, well, I think I could do that. (laughs) 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 And so, you know, sometimes you just green light yourself. And I was like, yeah, try that. Um, And, uh, you know, John Lewis, I made a film about John Lewis called John Lewis Good Trouble. Mm. Um, And traveling with him he 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 just would kind of show me sometimes the the most important decision you can make is what are you going to do tomorrow not you know kind of what your whole life plan but like and he would he literally would say to me there's always something you can do whether it's big or small there's always something that you can do to you know kind of make things better for yourself your family people you love your country etc and so i think like in my career i didn't like declare i was going to be a filmmaker right right right. i got interested in a particular story and i was in trying to figure out how to tell that story Hmm. i'm now a director (laughs) yeah i was going (laughs) to say it's not just a producer you 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 direct all uh, these films too yeah and so you know i'm a really happy person because of it and (laughs) like i get you know to explore the things I'm curious about most of the time somebody pays me for it <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm sure they're going to keep paying you to do that and I think to bring this all full circle I think doesn't um, um, doesn't Lady Bird say something similar towards the end of the film sometimes it's just about getting up in the morning and concentrating on the things you have to do that day and that's also what she admired in her husband is ability to just get up every morning because I mean one thing we haven't even talked about but uh, I mean she I, I mean I wasn't even aware how bad his depression was you know go, you know you know that was this. yeah that was um, Lady Bird in uh, in her diaries and I think that this is part of the reason she embargoed their release until you know after both of them had had died yeah um, you know but what's also really important to remember is Lady Bird not only released her tape, but she made Johnson's tape recording available to the public. Mm. So many, many films and and projects have, you know, noted that um, used the Johnson tapes, which are so significant. And that's because Lady Bird released them to the public. She said people ought to hear this history. But that's also why we have recordings of their conversation. Um, right. You know, which you probably thought nobody would really be interested in, but we were. <laughs> you were, and I was, and I've really enjoyed it. And I want to thank you again for making this film. Um, um, I, I, I think it's great. It, you don't have to be, but I was, I'm born and raised in, in Texas. And so uh, this had re- resonance as well, a little bit of walking down memory lane for me as well. And uh, thank you again. And if, uh, if we haven't scared you off, we'd love to have you on again sometime. So, uh, Dawn, thank you so much for being on Factual America. Just to remind our listeners and viewers, we've been talking with Dawn Porter, uh, the award-winning director and executive producer of The Lady Bird Diaries, released in November and streaming on Disney+. Plus. Do check it out. Thanks again for joining us on Factual America. A big shout-out to everyone at Intersound Audio in York, England, for their great studio and fine editing and production skills. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, which specializes in documentaries, television, and shorts about the U.S. for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is factualamerica.com.